get started. Um, we have two presentations today, so we need to uh, so we need to jump right into it. Um, our first presentation today is going to be by Josh Harvey. Um, Josh is my graduate student, so as you can imagine, there's no end of confusion as to uh, who the Josh we're talking about in the lab is. Um, Josh joins us from uh, Brigham Young University, where he did his uh, where he did his bachelor's. Um, as a Utah alumni, I'm supposed to make some snide comment about one of the other major schools to the south, um, but I'm not going to do that today because he's giving his presentation. Um, and Josh is going to be telling us about uh, plant root traits and nutrient homeostasis, a test of the H hypothesis. Josh. Well, thanks for the introduction, Josh, and for going easy there on BYU. Um, so yeah, the title of my talk, Plant Retreats and Nutrient Homeostasis, have quite a bit to cover, so I'll be moving at a good pace. Um, and I'll line up my talk, I'll be introducing you to the problem of nitrogen deposition, um, then moving into an introduction to ecological stoichiometry, this notion of stoichiometric homeostasis, then talking about how um, stoichiometric homeostasis has a bearing on plant responses to nitrogen deposition, and then discussing my experimental approach to investigating these phenomena. So nitrogen deposition is a process in which atmospherically suspended reactive forms of nitrogen are deposited onto land surfaces. Most commonly, this is nitrate and ammonia, um, which are the two forms of nitrogen that are readily available to plants. Uh, sources of this nitrogen range from fertilizer production and application to fossil fuel combustion. Um, a lot of it comes from anthropogenic sources. Also, it comes down in, in two manners, a dry manner and a wet manner. During dry deposition, the nitrogen precipitates out of the air column in a particulate form, whereas in the wet manner, it's picked up by rainfall or snowfall and then brought down to the land surface. Um, you can see here in these two maps, this is nitrogen deposition globally in the year 1860 at the start of the Industrial Revolution. And here's for the year 2000. This scale is in uh, kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, running up to about 60 kilograms of nitrogen. And human production of nitrogen um, has increased from about 15 teragrams, which is 15 million metric tons, up to 187 uh, per year by 2005. And the resulting deposition has increased from 34 teragrams to about 100 teragrams of nitrogen per year. And we're expected to double this by the year 2050, up to 200 teragrams of nitrogen per year. So we still have quite a ways to go in impacting the nitrogen cycle. Um, this is an animated map for total nitrogen deposition across the United States from 2000 to 2014. You can see that there's quite a bit of spatial and temporal variation in both the extent and the intensity of nitrogen deposition. But you can see here in South Dakota that we have a, a pretty good, pretty fair amount of nitrogen deposition happening on our side of the state. As we move across the state to where there's uh, less agricultural production, less rainfall, the nitrogen deposition is also to uh, not as intense. Researchers uh, like to use what they call these critical loads, which are thresholds above which we would expect to see uh, these negative impacts in nitrogen deposition. And once again, you can see here in South Dakota where a decent portion of the state um, falls above the critical load where we would expect to see these negative impacts of nitrogen deposition. And then a sliver of the state is right at that threshold and the, re the remains of the state are falling below that. These impacts are really wide ranging in scale from the organismal level up to ecosystem levels, impacting everything from fire regimes to uh, impacting organism susceptibility to secondary stress, a variety of aquatic impacts. Um, but for the sake of this study, I'm generally interested in these issues of invasive performance and, and how that can impact plant community diversity and, and structure. Generally, studies show that a lot of invasive species are linked to nitrogen availability and even deposition. And also a handful of studies showing that uh, nitrogen addition and deposition can even increase invasive performance. So in this study by Wei Ming et al, you have a uh, thistle population um, versus a variety of, of North American native plants. And these are under two levels of nitrogen addition meant to simulate depositional rates. And you can see that the mean increase in above ground biomass is higher for this invasive species in both cases. And this is um, echoed in research by Low et al. This is uh, cheatgrass, an invasive grass species, versus the native blue grama across a range of nitrogen level uh, additions, once again meant to simulate deposition. And you can see that in terms of above ground biomass, this invasive species really dominates 
So I'm interested in this question of, you know, what are these mechanisms that are underlying this increased performance in invasive species in response to nitrogen deposition? So I'm going to make kind of a quick jump now and give you an introduction to this idea of ecological stoichiometry, sort of this kind of subfield of ecology that uh, studies these balances of chemical elements within organisms and how those impact uh, ecological interactions. So you can think about um, you know, different organisms having different ratios of elements within their body. Um, so here you might have a grasshopper that has this ratio that naturally likes to stay at five carbon or one nitrogen versus its food source of grass, which may have a very different carbon nitrogen ratio of 33 to one. And for this grasshopper to maintain those ratios that it needs, it's going to need to expend energy to maybe alter its foraging behavior or some aspects of its metabolism to um, take these nutrients from the grass and, and turn it into the ratio that it naturally needs. Um, so generally, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus ratios are really common metrics that are examined in this field. Specifically, in, in sort of plant ecology, nitrogen phosphorus ratios are, are really common. So in, in these graphs from, from Goosewell, you can see these are uh, concentrations of nitrogen in, in leaf tissue, in, excuse me, in leaf tissue versus concentrations of phosphorus. And this forms a linear relationship. So as you increase the nitrogen contents in uh, plant tissues, that's matched by an increase in phosphorus. So they're trying to maintain that balance. And we're specifically looking at these elements because they play really uh, important roles in, in plant physiology. I mean, carbon makes up the bulk of an organism's weight, but nitrogen plays really key roles in amino acids and proteins, especially in chlorophyll. And then phosphorus um, is linked to ribosomes, RNA, uh, parts of the plant that are really important for growth. And we're not really interested in nitrogen and phosphorus ratios in and of themselves. We're interested in these ratios because they can tell us other things about plant physiology and growth and reproduction. So you can draw relationships like this where you have a range of nitrogen phosphorus ratios that are related to the relative growth rate of a plant, um, or other studies that look at nitrogen and phosphorus ratios um, and, and, and phosphorus uptake and retention or you know, the uptake and retention of other nutrients. I should mention here that the tissue nitrogen and phosphorus ratios are generally pretty different from what's in the soil. There's, there's some level of, of regulation that's happening with that uptake and use. And that introduces us to this idea of stoichiometric homeostasis, which is this active internal regulation of nutrient balances by an organism. And you know, organisms have some supply of nutrients given to them, and they need to, to change those ratios so they can get that balance that they need for proper growth proper reproduction, uh, et cetera. And oftentimes in literature, you might see these relationships like this where they examine kind of the nitrogen phosphorus ratios here in the XY plane of the soil and then compare that to some plant growth parameter here, root shoot ratios. And, and this sort of miss, misses a central link of tissue nitrogen phosphorus ratios. And, and knowing what's in the tissue might give us a better explanation or fit to these plant growth parameters that we see. So it's, it's pretty crucial not only to have an understanding of, of what's in the tissue, but the level of homeostasis that's getting us from what's in the soil to what's in the plant. And we can examine uh, these levels of homeostasis, of stoichiometric homeostasis, by drawing uh, a relationship between soil MP ratios and tissue MP ratios. If we were to go into the field and sample a plant population, we might get a, a scatter of data points like this, where each point is an individual plant across a range of of soil MP ratios. And we can describe this with a best fitted line. Um, in your mind, if you imagine kind of taking these data points and projecting them down onto the X, Y axis, uh, you can see that, that this kind of gives us the, the range of variation of nutrients in the soil. And we can see that the, the variation in the tissue isn't all that different. So probably what's in the soil is being reflected by what's in the tissue of the plant. If we were to examine, say, a different species, we might get a different scatter of data points, which, once again, we could describe with a best-fitted line. And once again, if we imagine projecting these data points down, we can see that the variation of what's in the tissue of the organism is much smaller than the range of variation of what's being supplied to it. And this would indicate that there's a pretty high level of homeostasis happening, that the plant's regulating either its uptake or internal balance of these nutrients. So we can compare these two, we see that the higher the slope you have in this relationship, the less homeostasis there is, and vice versa, where a lower slope would indicate higher homeostasis. And we can get a number value out of this by, um, by bringing up this equation for a line, where the parameter for the slope, we take the inverse of that, and this gives us this coefficient for h, um, and that gives us the level 
uh, or the intensity of stoichiometric homeostasis. So in this comparison here, uh, we have western wheatgrass, which has, of the, of the two species, this has a shallower slope, and that gives us the higher uh, level of stoichiometric homeostasis at 9.6, um, compared to uh, this newly sedge, which has a higher slope, and therefore it has this lower level of homeostasis quantified at 7.16. And so this leads us up into um, this H hypothesis. This is the result of work done last year by some researchers of Colorado State. Uh, and they were examining 25 years of uh, plant community composition data um, done at the Konza Long-Term Ecological Research Station out in, out in Kansas. And this was the results of a long-term fertilization experiment. Um, and they were looking at what changes were happening in, the, in diversity in plant communities and then matching that up with the H values of these plant species. And they took those species as well and put them through a short-term irrigation and rain shelter study. And what they found was that this H coefficient functions pretty well as a predictor variable for how plant populations will respond to these long-term nitrogen additions. And so the results of their study, they took that and kind of break it up into three parts, what they termed this H hypothesis, being that um, we would expect high H species to have uh, a lot of temporal stability and dominate in highly variable environments or environments that are limited by nutrients, which are grasslands in general, which are you know, limited by nitrogen and often phosphorus too, and have high variability in rainfall and temperature. Um, the other, the second part of this hypothesis is that long-term nutrient additions should be suppressing high H species, but then promoting the growth and success of low H species. And finally, that they expect that high H species will also be less sensitive to alterations in other soil resources, specifically water. And they, they kind of forward this idea that root extensivity might be this mechanism behind these patterns that they're observing. The idea being that high H species would maintain really extensive root systems. And that would allow them more efficiency in capturing and storing nutrients, which would buffer their growth, their metabolism, and physiology in the face of uh, the variability of the environment. And so from there, we can kind of build this idea of this being a matter of cost and investments, where if you're a high H species and you're maintaining a really extensive root system, you're investing a lot of carbon into building that. But because they're highly homeostatic, um, when you face that increase of nitrogen in the soil, you're not going to be uptaking that as much. So you have this low return on investment. You're not getting a lot of nitrogen out of the investment of carbon that you're putting into the roots. In contrast, if you're a low H species, you might have um, really high nitrogen uptake because you're not as regulatory um, with your tissue ratios. But you may have low or variable um, investment of carbon into the roots, which will give you a higher return on investment. And then we would expect that these kinds of returns on investments would then um, impact the growth responses of these plants. They also believe that this matter of root extensivity could also explain the response of these plants to drought, where high age species that have extensive roots would be able to access deeper layers of water or lateral water resources. Um, and this is important to note because not only as nitrogen deposition increases in the future, but we expect global climate change to become more of an issue with higher temperatures, driving higher evapotranspiration rates, which will lead to more frequent soil dry downs. So there may be these competitive interactions that are already altered by nitrogen deposition. These can be modulated by water availability in the soil. So to briefly recap, nitrogen deposition is a problem that's impacting um, South Dakota uh, in this gradient, and the nitrogen deposition may be impacting the performance of invasive species and native species, and that root extensivity might be this mechanism behind the patterns that we're observing um, with plant responses to deposition uh, using this, this H metric. So my proposed experiment will be examining two parts of this H hypothesis, the general idea being um, to take low H and high H species, grow them under different levels of water supply and nitrogen supply. Um, I'll be examining four C3 grasses, two invasive and two native species. Um, the invasives being spirit grub and Kentucky bluegrass, the natives being western wheatgrass and Canada wild rye. I'll be growing these in a sand culture supplied with four different nitrogen phosphorus ratio ratios using a Hoagland solution, which will give the plants the other micronutrients that they need. Um, and I'll be taking multiple harvests of these plants to see if age has any effect on their levels of stoichiometric homeostasis. Once we do that to determine um, the age coefficients of these species,
I, I should pause here and note that I expect that these invasive species will have a lower age than uh, the native species, which I expect to have a high age. That doesn't turn out that my study will take an unexpected turn, but that's what I'm expecting right now. Um, the full experiment will be uh, determining these treatment effects on root extensivity. This will be a two by two by two uh, experimental design where um, I'll be taking two species and supplying them at a low and high rate of nitrogen supply. And then two water treatment levels, one where pots will be maintained at about field capacity so they have sufficient water, and another which will have cyclical soil dry down to simulate repeated drought. Um, and with 10 pots per treatment combination, that works up to the 80 pots. And I'll be replicating this experiment twice uh, in the summer, so two of the species will be in the first replication, the other two in, in the second replication. At the end of the treatment period, I'll be um, harvesting these plants We'll be excising the roots and we can uh, scan these with a flatbed scanner and analyze the, these images with the program with Rhizo, which will give us estimates of plant root system volume and length, surface area, and we can use um, that to give, get this measure of root extensivity. I'll be measuring um, the plant organs for biomass and then sampling those for carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus ratios. The expected results uh, for the study um, I expect that these high H species should maintain a high root extensivity and investment across the treatment levels, that those should not differ, and that these low H species um, should either have low measures of root investment or extensivity or possibly variable uh, differences. There's not a lot in the literature to suggest what to expect here, so it'll kind of be something that will come as a surprise. Um, and I also expect that these symptoms of drought stress, such as leaf turnover or xylem water potential, will impact these low H species more than high H species would. Um, the data coming back to us when I'm determining the H level for these species will be some discrete time series data for an H and H combinations I can examine. Uh, determining that H will just be as simple as drawing up a fit line, taking a linear regression from earlier. For the full experiment, um, I'll be analyzing this with an analysis of covariance, where my covariance will be H, and then the factors will be the nitrogen level supply and water supply levels. Overall, I hope that you know this kind of lays some <laughs> groundwork for using H as a more predictive variable and testing this H hypothesis. But overall, I hope this elucidates um, these mechanisms behind why invasive plants are responding uh, so positively to nitrogen deposition. Um, so I would like to end by thanking my advisor first and foremost for his advice and guidance as I've been developing this project. My committee members, Laura Perkins and Dr. Shuvan, also Joel Brauber from the physics department, my funding source, the Department of Natural Resource Management, and finally my technician, uh, Madison, who's already given me a lot of help with some of my pilot experiments. Um, so thank you, I'll happily take any questions you might have. Josh, very interesting concept and idea. And I, it, are you doing this on seedlings or on mature plants? Um, so determining the the age coefficient for um, should I be repeating this for the Western yeah. folks? Yes, so the question was, um, am I going to be examining this with seedlings or fully developed plants? Um, kind of yes and yes. When I'm determining the age coefficient for the plants in the first place, I'll start at seedlings and take those repeated samples so we'll get um, that measure for some seedlings and as they grow up older, but for the full experiment I'll probably probably be using established plants. Um, I haven't seen quite a bit of literature yet suggesting that there might be uh, age impacts, but that's something I'm considering and hopefully you can see in that time series data. Well your background information and the slides and the pictures early on was Kind of the hypothesis about prairies, grasslands, etc. You know, those are all established mature plants, right. and very little is seedlings. You know how prairies uh, reproduce themselves vegetatively. So I'm wondering if the age the process of determining the age on a seedling is really not relevant to what's really going on as these plants are surviving and have you know extensive bud work. Uh, blood bank, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm and curious to know if the H test on a seedling in this study versus the H test on a 
Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting point to bring up. Um, you know, part of the reason I was interested in looking at these age effects with seedlings was um, you know, answering this question of seedling mortality, which possibly could be high, but as you point out, you know, grasslands tend to reproduce asexually, so, so yeah, I, I do hope to kind of capture that reality by using established plants. Along those lines, it looked like the pots you're planning to use are about a foot deep, and yet the slides that you showed of the root systems of some of these uh, H species were very much deeper than that. Right. Is, is that going to be a limitation on the transferability of your results? I don't expect so. So those images of those deep roots were grown in, in 255-gallon drums, so they had a lot of space and over three years of growth. Um, I won't be growing these species so long that they fill up the pots. Right now, at the end of my pot experiment, I'm kind of seeing that um, after growing them since March, I believe, you know, they, they're starting to fill up the pots. The length of this experiment, I'll be keeping shorter just to make sure that they don't have any root bound effects to interfere with the study. Is there a question back here? Is a high H species always a high H species, no matter where it's growing? That's a good question. Um, there's not a lot of literature using this metric in plant studies, um, but there's some evidence. Uh, one author, Dijkstra, uh, looks at changes in plant populations across kind of climate change, um, and what what he's showing is that that can have like water availability and temperature may have some impact on these H levels of species. So it looks like there may be some variability. Um, in just that metric as well, but it appears to be relatively a, a stable set metric. Why don't you ask for a question from um, Yeah, is there any questions from the West River folks? Okay, so Roger Gates asks, uh, Western reedgrass is adapted to fine textured soils. Will conducting experiments in coarse textured soils lead to misleading results about that species? Um, I, wonder, I, I suppose I wouldn't expect so. Um, I know that soil texture can have impacts on kind of the mechanisms of root growth and, and the patterns there, but since I'm more concerned with nutrient uptake, um, I expect that the texture of the soil won't have as big of an impact. All right, I think we should move on to the next talk. Thank you, John.